Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Real Foot Lake. Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home here in beautiful, and today it's rainy, West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Alexis, as usual, before I introduce today's guest, what is something you've discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? Well, I actually learned that the Gutenberg Press reproduction that we have upstairs on the third level is actually a full scale, fully functional reproduction. Like our education staff could use it um, for a lesson if they wanted. And I didn't know that. And sometimes they do. Mm -hmm. They can actually print from it. It's a really cool experience to see. Thank you for that. That is an interesting um, fact about Discovery Park. Our guest today is Jacob Dublin, founder of Powerhouse Athletics in Dresden, Tennessee. Welcome, Jacob. Hi, guys. How are you? Fantastic. And I know you and Alexis are already friends, which is Certainly. which is which is great. Y'all are in the same community group at your church. So great. Did you recommend him as a guest? Yes. Yeah. I was like, hey, Jacob, we do this podcast at Discovery Park. What do you think? And he's like, yeah. I was like, okay, perfect. Excellent. Very nice. Well, it's going to be fun talking with him. Um, so, Jacob, tell me a little bit about where you're from, um, where you went to school, that sort of thing. So I was born and raised in Martin. Uh, so grew up in Martin. We moved, we moved to East Tennessee while I was in high school. My parents were bivocational missionaries. And so while we were over there, I ended up attending Bryan College um, for my undergrad and my graduate degree, played baseball there. Um, and then once I graduated there, my parents had already moved back to Martin. And so that's how I, I ended up back in Martin. So for people who don't know, what is a bivocational missionary? So basically what that means is they still have a full-time job. Um, and so by vocational, so two vocations. Um, so they still had full-time jobs, but um, on our weekends during the summers and things like that, we would be the ones that hosted uh, uh, mission groups to come into that area and do mission work either for a week or over the weekend and things like that. And so we were under catalyst missions out of Nashville. Um, my dad's friend was Andrew Brown, the one that was over it. And so, that's kind of how all that got together. And so growing up, were you um, an athletic little kid right from the start? Uh, I mean, I was just your average run of the mill kid. I only played baseball. And so like once rec league started, I'd play. And then the rest of the year, I didn't really do anything. I just went outside and was a kid. <laughs> uh, I was fortunate. A lot of my family, uh, they had a lot of land. And so we'd go outside and just do normal, normal kid stuff. And so uh, I wasn't really... I was athletic, but not like I wasn't a superstar by any means. Uh, once I got to high school, my junior year, it started taking off a little bit. And so that's when I got that's when I got the offer to play. I got my offer my senior year to play at Bryan College in East Tennessee. And so that's where I went for school. And was that was that the dream or did it just sort of evolve to that? Uh, no, I wanted to play like big Division One SEC baseball. But when you're a junior and senior, uh, if you really don't have any offers there, you're probably not going to go. Um, and so the school, the school I went to was only about an hour and a half from where we lived in East Tennessee. And I had been looking there for academics anyways, um, just because it was a liberal art, it was a private Christian liberal arts school. And so I would have a lot of opportunities to do different classes because of the degrees they made you take uh, other other um, subject areas. And so that was one thing I was interested in. And it was a private Christian school. Um, that was the one thing I was really interested in because I was always a public school uh, growing up all the way through K through 12 was public school. And so this would be a little bit different. Um, so I was already looking to go there anyways, because my, they had the master's degree I wanted to. Um, and so when I got the offer to play baseball, I was like, well, I mean, it's just it, it's set up perfectly there. And so that's why I went. And what was the master's degree that you wanted? Uh, sports management. And so I got my undergraduate in um, <clears throat> business management. Um, and then I went straight into getting my MBA in sports management uh, just because I knew sports and business was pretty much the stuff I wanted to do growing up. I just didn't know what exactly that would look like. And so did you have any brothers or sisters? Yes, I do have a younger brother. Uh, and I say younger just because he's bigger than me. Uh, it's always been that way since about 
my sophomore year of high school. And so he's four years younger than me, but that's the only brother that I have. And does he so. also, was he into athletics and sports? And uh, He was growing up, but as soon as he hit high school, he, he turned more towards the hunting and the fishing, uh, hunting and fishing scene, which fits his personality perfectly. Um, we, we get along really well, but we are complete opposites. And so it's always funny when people figure out that we're actually brother actually brothers so did you um as you were playing baseball and as you were going to college did you find yourself trying to coach your friends and fellow athletes and trying to help them improve uh their performance um not for a while uh when i got there i was a catcher and so i caught a lot and then my sophomore year, they changed me over to a pitcher, um, which was fine. I just didn't know anything about it. And so I'm starting from square one, uh, my second year of college. And so a lot of it came from me trying to figure stuff out. And like when you're on a college team, like the, the coaches really don't have time to really sit down with somebody that's new. They're just trying to get guys that are good, get them in there, get them playing, which is, I guess, their job. Um, so that's kind of where this started from. It's just, I, I didn't know where to start. Like I knew, Hey, go throw and try to throw hard. But uh, the more that I started researching and look into it, there's a lot more behind it than that. Um, and so I actually worked with a trainer for about two years while I was in college. That was very specific, like very pitching specific. Um, and that's where a lot of this came from. Um, I, I really enjoy the process of getting to throw harder, be bigger, be stronger and things like that in the baseball area. Um, and so that's a lot where it came from just, having to figure out on my own and then helping other people bridge that gap. Um, I originally didn't, this was, this, this facility wasn't really a plan for me when I graduated, I was trying to get into front office of professional sports in some capacity, uh, just cause that's what my, my master's degree was in. I really, I really enjoy going to stadiums being there. Uh, that's the atmosphere I like being in. So I was really pushing towards that. But when I was back uh, after I graduated, there was a local high school kid that came up to me. He was like, hey, this my upcoming year, senior year. Um, I'm good at baseball, but I don't have any offers yet. Like I'm trying to go to college. And so I was like, well, I don't have anything else to do. I don't mind helping at all. And so me and him probably six days a week from that August to that December, uh, he went from having no offers to uh, to getting an offer from the at that time, it was the number one team in the country for junior college on um, Walter State. And so once that started, once his recruiting process started to kick up a little bit, I was like, you know, I think I could probably do this for a living because um, I, I enjoyed that process just because when you're with kids that really, really want to be there and want to learn and want to grow, it makes your job so much easier. Um, and that's kind of where it came from. And so the building I'm in now basically fell in my lap, uh, just connections that I had. They were like, Hey, we're trying to get rid of this building. Went and looked at it and it was perfectly set up. And I was like, well, it's either now or never. And so I, I just went ahead and went after it. And I, I think we're doing all right. So. Yeah, that's great. You know, we're going to dive into that a little bit more because I have some questions there, but I'm also <laughs> curious, uh, the young man that you, um, helped coach, you know, mm-hmm. for somebody who who is not a baseball player, talk me through the process of getting someone from point A to point Z or wherever you want to get them. How, you know, what do yeah. you look at and, and what, what do you do? So I'll, I'll just use him as an example. His thing was he was really tall. Alexis probably knows him. He's really tall. Uh, the thing was he was really skinny, a uh, little undersized at that point. And so I looked at, hey, your body, your body, you're tall, but you're not very filled out. There's not a lot of muscle there. And so one of our main things was putting size on him, getting getting his strength uh, pretty high and then also getting him on a throwing program. And so having a consistent, detailed, scheduled throwing program that uh, over the months allowed him to throw more, allowed his body to relax and to throw harder. And so just a combination of working out and getting stronger along with having a, a throwing program that was fit towards him and really, uh, really focusing on what he needs to, to do to throw harder and throw better. Uh, that's, kind of, that's pretty much the simple version of it. There's a lot more into it, but um, basically just improving over time is what has the biggest returns. Uh, I, I wasn't really focused on getting him to throw as hard as he can as soon as we started, uh, just because his body wasn't ready for that. And so it was just a continual preparation, uh, improvement. And then after five or six months, you look back and you've gained 10 miles an hour. And so he went from 
81, 82, 83 miles an hour to 88, 89, 90 miles an hour within six months. Um, and so that's kind of that's kind of the progress we had there. And so that's when he started to get uh, recruited. Um, that's why that's why he wasn't getting recruited as a senior in high school throwing 80 is just because uh, college coaches want kids that are good. Um, and so like when you go to college, usually the higher levels, 88 is about the the lowest that they'll take. And so he kept asking me, why might I get recruited? I'm like, well, honestly, you don't throw hard enough. Um, I know you're a really good pitcher. I've seen you pitch. You do very well. But at the next level, these hitters, like they're they're used to seeing 90, 91, 92. And so we got to get you to that baseline. And I promise you, once that happens, things will start kicking up for you. And so that's kind of what the process looked like. And is it is it like it is in the movies where the recruiters are sitting up in the stands and you're looking up over at them to see what they're writing down? <laughs> Uh, a little bit. Um, uh, that's kind of what it started with. And actually, it was weird. We there's a there's a platform on Twitter that you can tag in videos and stuff. I um, mean, they retweeted out and all the coaches. There's a bunch of coaches that follow that. And that's originally where he started getting seen because a lot of coaches saw that started contacting him. And then when a season started, uh, there was there was guys in the stands um, pretty regularly. And so it was just a, it was a cool thing to see to come to the game because I'd get off of work and go drive and watch this game. And there'd be two or three guys behind the plate with a radar gun and a notepad. I was like, yeah, that's, that's pretty cool to see that. And so that's a, yeah, it's a little bit like so that. So it must have been uh, really fulfilling <laughs> when he started getting offers. And he did he get oh, yeah. the offer from you said he, where he wanted to go. He got the offer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they they contacted him early and then they we didn't hear much. Um, and then as the season went on. They, they contacted me and like, hey, do you want to come on a visit? Come check out the campus. Come check out the facilities. Um, and then when we got there, he invited me to go with him, which was fun um, just to just to see that because I've, I've been I've done that before. And so seeing somebody else go through that process, it's always fun to see that. And so when we got there, they're like, hey, we really want we really want you here. Um, you're a good player, good body, you got a good arm. And so if if you got the offer to come here and he took it before we even left. There was no thinking about it or anything. And so that was, that was very fulfilling to see that. And, and is he doing well now? Is he still playing? Well, the, in the junior college world, most freshmen get redshirted. Um, that's just kind of, ha- that's just the reality of it. Um, and so he got redshirted, but during the fall, he did very well. Top of the top team in ERA, top of the team and runs given up. And so I think, for being a freshman against some of the one of the biggest schools in the country as far as baseball, I think he did all right. Yeah, that's great. So we're going to take a, a quick break, and then when we get back, I want to find out more about uh, opening your business and some of the things that that uh, go, went on behind the scenes there. So we'll be right back. Real Foot Lake is a natural wonder, famous for its bald cypress trees, nesting bald eagles, and waterfowl of all kinds. From Real Foot Lake State Park to Lake Isom National Wildlife Refuge, a visit to the area provides a whole world of nature to discover. You'll find year-round hunting, fishing, bird watching, canoeing, kayaking, hiking, and more. To plan your experience, visit realfoottourism.com. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, it would really help us if you would subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review for us on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. This is your host, Scott Williams, and our guest today is Jacob Dublin, founder of Powerhouse Athletics. So uh, earlier when we were chatting, we talked about you've opened a gym, a facility called Powerhouse Athletics. Talk to me a little bit about the inspiration to do that. And, uh, describe what the business is and uh, tell me a little bit um, about how it's going. So the inspiration was from the kid that we just talked about um, going through that process. It started, I started realizing, OK, I could really. I could really do good at this. Uh, there's a lot of really good athletes in this area. Um, but the problem is there's there's not really a person that can bridge that gap between where they're at now and getting them to the next level. Because uh, that's one of the things growing up here and then being back here, I've seen there's a lot of really good athletes. But there's not a big group every year that goes to college to play sports. And so um, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but I think there, the, the, the community was missing somebody that could bridge that gap. 
Um, and so that's kind of where I, I feel like, hey, I could really I could bridge that gap. Um, so basically what we do is just it's just training. Um, and so a lot of people, a lot of people, when they hear baseball, they think of lessons like one time a week, two times a week. And, and that's not what we do. And so it's more of a group style training. And I do this for several reasons, just because um, with with the group style, you're with a bunch of other kids. And so that's how it is on any team. Once you get to college, there's 25, 30, 35 of you and four coaches, three coaches. Um, and so you have to be, you have to be used to being your own coach and being, being self-sufficient. And so that was one main reason of it. And in the group training, you get to compete with the guy beside you all the time. Um, there's, it's a, it builds a good community around here. Um, the environment we got in here now, we have a bunch of kids that are constantly pushing, pushing each other. Um, we have a good time in here and we're, we have a really good time, but we're also working hard because the kids in here, um, they want to be here. And I set it up this way just because we don't give lessons. And so I don't want the kid once a week that comes in because his mom makes them. Um, I'm not, I'm not saying anything about people that give lessons. That's, that's perfectly fine. That's not the route that I wanted to go. Um, I wanted to take the kids that want to be here um, that are, that are reaching out to me like, Hey, I want to get better. Um, and I'm setting up their, their thing, the minimum three days a week um, up to five days. I've had kids in here that have been here since last February, March that have been here five days a week since then. And, and that product shows, um, it's, it's more that, cause I want to, I want them to be able to be consistent and understand that to play baseball at a high level, it is an everyday thing. Um, cause that was my wake up call. Cause when I was in high school, I didn't play travel ball. I didn't have lessons or any of that. So when practice started, that's when I started playing. And when season was over, I was done for the year. Um, then when I got to college, it was a wake up call. Cause my first week on campus, they're like, Hey, we have practice in two weeks. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's August. And so I'm trying to, I'm trying to get these guys to understand what, what it looks like and that, going to the school that you want really isn't that far out of reach. There's just certain numbers that you, you have to get to, uh, to get there. And so that's kind of where I step in. Um, some of we have a, the big group I have now, they're freshmen in high school. And so a lot of these kids are really starting to realize like, Hey, like this is, this is doable to get where I want to go. And so that's kind of where it started. Um, I, I just want to do it this way just because, it teaches a thing of responsibility too. I know everybody these days, like all these kids, I tell you what, they're just something else. And so um, that also goes back on the people in charge and leadership. And so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to step in and be like, Hey, I, I want to show these kids what it looks like to kind of grow up and be, be that person that they can come back to if something goes wrong. Um, Cause I, I hope a bunch of these kids know this, but like I do anything for them. And so like, I want to be, be that support for them um, just because I think a lot of the times parents tell them stuff all the time <clears throat> and they don't listen, but they hear from somebody else and it clicks. And so um, it's kind of a culmination of things. Like I want to get, I want them to get good at sports, but I also want them to be prepared for life and understand that <clears throat> you're going to fail at some point. It's just how quickly can you pick yourself up? And so a lot of the times I intentionally set them up for failure inside of here because baseball is a very uh, it's, it, it's littered with failure. Uh, in every capacity and so this translates over to life too and so that's kind of a, a general uh, sense of what we do for parents who are listening what what advice or suggestions do you give them both you know to help their kids but also to help their kids succeed on a grander scale which is what you're really mm -hmm. trying to do well i really try to emphasize that baseball should not be their identity uh, you should not determine like your attitude and your actions based on uh, how you perform on the field. Um, and I kind of, I'm, I'm hoping the parents hear that too and be like, okay, I shouldn't get mad at my kid because he had a bad game on the field. If he gave a hundred percent effort, you're going to fail at some point. Um, and so that's kind of what I'm trying to get them to understand. Like on a grander scale, like at some point you're going to have to hang up your cleats. Um, Cause I had to do it. It wasn't fun. It never is fun. But I want them to be able to look back and be like, all right, I did what I could. Like the my my slogan says, leave no doubt. Like I want them to be able to, when they're done, or like when they walk out the door every day, be like, all right, I left everything I had in on their day. And then when they're done with sports and, and whenever that takes place, they can look back and be like, all right, I did what I could. And there's not any uh, regrets or thoughts about what if I could have done more? What if I could have done more? And so that's kind of the grander uh, scheme of things. And I want these kids to understand that just because you're good in this area doesn't mean you're going to be good when you get in the big pond. Um, Cause when I was in high school, uh, I mean, I had all the awards, all the, all district, all tournament, whatever I could. But once I got to college, nobody cared um, just because 
uh, when I got there, there was a lot of kids that were way better than me. And so it was a wake up call there. And so I'm trying to get them to understand like, yeah, you may be really good in this area, which is fine. I'm proud of you for putting in the work, but you got to understand um, every school has one of you. And once you get on college, once you get to a college team, everybody was the best kid on their team. And so what are you doing uh, to set yourself up once you get to college to be an impact player? Now, there's other people who are listening right now who have an idea or a vision for something they want to be doing, a business they want to open. Um, but sometimes mm-hmm. it can be scary. You know, they're thinking, what if I fail? Mm-hmm. What if I, what if I don't know what I'm doing? Talk to us a little bit about the steps you went through uh, before you finally cut the red ribbon to open the front door. Yeah, so it was – uh, it was a very long process, but a very short process at the same time. Uh, once I started to realize that I could do what I'm doing for a living, um, uh, it was a long planning process of kind of getting the steps together. Like, okay, got to get a building. And that kind of fell into place there. Uh, very, <laughs> very fortunate for that. I'm like, all right, I got to get equipment. I got to get, I got to get turf, got to get nets, got to get just everything you need to get it open. And so uh, there was a lot of planning that went in behind it um, to get everything to get everything ready. Um, but once I got the keys to the building, got the keys to the building on November 13th, and it looked like it does now in 47 days. I, I did the count. Um, and so it was a very long planning process, but a very short turnaround time because I had an opening date of January 3rd of 2022. Um, because if I would have waited much longer than that, it would been it have been hard. Um, it, it was scary uh, just because there's there's no guarantees. Like I'm, it's not like I go to a job and I'm guaranteed a paycheck every week, every two weeks. Like I, I am in charge of my paycheck right now, um, and so it's up to me um, on the value that I provide. Uh, the people see value in the services I provide. Um, it's a lot of uh, a lot of it goes back to my faith, like. Uh, I know I'm here for a reason and I trusted in the gifts that I was given um, and a lot of prayer, <laughs> a lot of prayer, just because it, it is scary uh, doing something like this because nothing, nothing's guaranteed when you open up your own business. And so being a wise steward of what I was given, uh, I was very fortunate. There were several things that fell into place uh, that really made it a lot easier on me. Um, and so when those things fell into place, it's just, okay, how, how well can I steward this to make sure that, um, uh, I use it wisely and that it doesn't backfire on me and I have to shut down and things like that. And so um, if you're, if you're confident in what you do, uh, you just got to put out the actual steps to, to, to make money off of it. Um, And that I know it sounds simple there, but it's just how confident are you um, and how confident that you're, that the service that you're going to provide will bring value to the people that you're giving it to, but people also pay for value. And so, um, if you have a very high value, you can make a lot of money off of it. And so that's the things that I would look at. Just does it have value? And is there is there a need for that value in the community? And so that's why I opened this here, because I knew um, with the with the product or the the person I've already created with him. And I say I created it. He did all the work. I just set up the, the framework for him. Um, that's that's all his. Um, but having that that result and then having. I knew a lot of people that wanted it. And so I was fortunate. A lot of them started as soon as I opened, but just have a consistent uh, under promise and over deliver. That's usually where you make your money. Um, just prom- you can just, I told them, like, I can't promise you anything. Uh, I can promise you you're going to get better. Uh, it's up to you how much you're going to get better. And so uh, under promise, over deliver, and things have pretty much taken care of themselves since then. Um, just trying to be wise with my money, wise with my time, wise with my resources. And, so, and then, and then, uh, who exactly is your target audience? Like when you, if you run an ad, who are you targeting? <laughs> uh, and so actually me and Alexis talked about this a few weeks ago. And so it depends on what platform you're talking about. And so like Instagram, Instagram is more of a younger generation. And so the, the, the content that we're going to put out on Instagram is more for the younger kids seeing the day to day, uh, what it looks like in here, like the, the throwing and the hitting and the weightlifting and everything there. And then like on Facebook and, in places that more of the parents are, um, it's showing them like the the progress and then the value of what of what um, what they're going to get if they come in here. And so most of the time, it is for the parent. Uh, the the target audience is the parents because they're the ones paying for it. Like I don't know a thirteen year old, fourteen year old that's got a job to be able to pay for this. 
And so a lot of it is for the parents. And fortunately, um, uh, the, the people that I'm related to, they know uh, a lot of them have kids that are the age to come in here. And so the, the word spreads pretty quick. Once one or two get good, the word spreads. And so that's kind of how it's been. Um, and so um, they come in from, I'm assuming, the region. What's your farthest mm-hmm. away person that comes in? Oh, goodness. Uh, we have several from Martin, several from Dresden. Uh, we had a few from Union City uh, for a while. And so it's kind of all over. We I do remote training as well. And so I've had some of those guys. I've, I have one in Trenton right now, family, friend, and then I've, I've had some out of Georgia. And so it just depends on uh, – just depends uh, just because sometimes it's a seasonal thing just because they play other sports. And so I can't train them year round, but most of the time, a lot of them from Martin uh, Westview, Martin middle, we got some from Dresden middle Dresden high school uh, all over. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, congratulations on your success. I'm uh, following you, you on your, your social media so I can, can follow mm-hmm. you, your continued success. If somebody's interested and wants to find out more about powerhouse athletics, where do they go? Well, uh, social media, uh, they can go and see there. All of our contact information is on there. Uh, we have a website. You can go on there. You can send me a message directly. Uh, my email's on there. The the phone number's on there. So you can email us, call us. I mean, my door's always open when I'm here. And so you can come in and ask whatever you want. Uh, come check out the facility. And what's the URL of your website? Uh, so it's www dot powerhouse athletics tn.com great and so people can also uh, google powerhouse athletics dresden and you come up so um well thank you so much it's been so interesting having you on the show today i appreciate it and thank you alexis for the uh, suggestion absolutely and thanks to all you listeners who've joined jacob and me today at discovery park of america our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond to plan an experience here for you and your family visit discoveryparkofamerica.com <laughs>